Welcome back to Deconstructing Health and Fitness. It's been a minute. Both of us hosts have had a lot of different things going on in our personal realm, so we haven't done a lot of recording yet, but we're very excited to get back to it today because we have a very special guest. Their name is Megan Crushley, and they are going to help us discuss inclusion in fitness today and a couple of other really important topics that I think deserve a lot more uh, spotlight. So I'm going to give them an opportunity to talk a little bit about their certifications and what they've done in their recent past that has brought them to this very amazing place to be able to talk about this with us today. So take it away, Megan. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, I guess to start out with when talking about my work is um, I came to fitness after a background in teaching, um, traveling the world when I was younger, studying Buddhism in college at Smith College and always being into things like uh, behavior. I always struggled with habits and behavior, things like stress management skills. And those things were heightened by you know, when I came out as a lesbian when I was 17 and and had a, a pretty bad coming out experience. Like there's definitely a spectrum of these experiences, um, but mine was very isolating. Um, and that's something we can talk about a little bit, but it's definitely the background to the work that I do and the work that I do in my own coaching with the queer community. And then also the work that I do in educating fit pros and coaches around LGBTQ plus issues and issues of gender diversity and making fitness a safer and more inclusive place for people in the queer community. And I use I use the word queer. It's it's something that's a reclaimed slur. So it's definitely a generational thing that I see even within my own community that, you know, I, I definitely have some people that are like, why are you using the word queer? You know, when I was when I was in high school, when I was growing up, that was something that was derogatory and is painful for me. And so I always preface this, no matter if I'm speaking to an audience of, you know, you know, mixed people, as far as I don't know if they're in my community or not, or just people in my community, because that is a word that is something that's still a charged word for people. Sometimes I, I say that I use it because I can't just keep saying LGBTQ plus over and over again. So I also say it because I'm in the community and that's how I identify as myself. And I also think that the queer, the word queer is a much larger umbrella that encompasses really a consciousness as well. It's not just about sexuality or uniqueness. It's, it's, it's a, definitely encompasses more of an understanding of gender too. And so the work that I've been doing recently is I recently launched my certification called Fitness Beyond the Binary, um, coaching gender diverse clients as a kind of foundational 101 um, community approach to educating people in my field, in the field of, of health and fitness and coaching around things like language, around things like experience, around things like heightened allesthetic load and, and queer health statistics in the LGBTQ plus community, which really don't get talked about outside of my community. Um, but then also including things like how to be an athlete um, advocate as a coach. If you're, if you're coaching kids or youth or, you know, high school kids and you have someone who is a gender diverse person on your team, and we can talk about what that, you know, phrasing gender diverse means as well. And so, yeah, that's really kind of what I've been doing lately. There's so much to unpack in that intro, right? And this is one of the reasons that we've invited you on, right? Because we talk a lot about sort of some of the issues that face people coming into fitness and why it can be so challenging and uncomfortable. And I think some of the work that you're doing really starts to speak to that um, through marginalized communities. But I don't think it's just marginalized communities that feel this way in fitness. I think it's a bigger problem. And this is something that we started to talk, talk about uh, when we met previously was like how that impacts your overall health and fitness, right? If you're looking at trying to become healthier in whether it's food or whether it's exercise or any other modality of health and wellness, if you don't feel comfortable approaching that environment or the people in that environment, how good are the results you're going to get? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I always use the example. I have a lot of different examples from a lot of different people, but I use the example of myself because I'm someone that, that I've been an athlete my whole life. That was a major part of my identity growing up. I played a lot of different sports. It was something that was very, um, 
healing for me. It was something where I found I kind of was bullied as a kid and had all these different things going on. And then I found a lot of, there's a lot of like glory in sports. You know, there's a lot of like, Hey, you're repping our community or our school and you know, you're crushing it. That's amazing. And you have this community around you. I loved all the people that I played sports with. And so for me and and fitness as well, when I was coming out, when I was a, a senior in high school, um, I got really fit. I was going to college to play volleyball and I ended up playing rugby, rugby there as well. Um, which was kind of an, a, an odd decision. My mom was like, what? Do you know how much money I spent on your teeth? You're going to play rugby? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had braces. I had braces. Um, and my mom's a nurse. So, But it was something where fitness was an outlet for me. Like my home was not, you know, I love my family and I love my mom, but they were not okay when I came out. And so as I was going through this process, I would go to school. I'd go play a sport and then I'd literally go to the gym for like one or two hours. Mm. And um, it was something that was very affirming for me. It was something that was in line with my identity. It was something that I, I, that was much healthier than what I was doing before then, which was drinking until I got blackout drunk to deal with my sexuality and what was happening with me. And some, that's something I talk about a lot, that substance abuse in the LGBTQ plus community is 20 to 30 percent, depending on the subgroup. And there's not a ton of research in our community or very under research community, as are a lot of minority groups in the United States. Um, but it, in comparison, the substance abuse rate in the general population is eight to nine percent in the LGBTQ population is 20 to 30 percent. It's a massive that, difference. That's huge. That's huge, you know. Um, and so it's, it's things like that when we talk about education, even within my own community, that if if I'm going to a gym, right, and I say this in my background as far as like what fitness and athletics has been for me, I have a lot of confidence now as someone that is a trainer, you know, with lots of experience. I, my wife and I own our own business. We had our own training facility for six years. We just didn't re-up our lease, you know, uh, in August of 2021 because of just continued COVID restrictions where we live. And it just wasn't feasible to keep doing that. But we transitioned really successfully online. And that's really when I started to, um, you know, really after what my community endured with Trump, which we're now seeing continue to happen, which is this really major push to, you know, continue to persecute and single out and and dehumanize the LGBTQ plus community um, and especially especially the trans and non-binary community. But that's just a low hanging fruit. That's kind of just the doorway into mm -hmm. the rest of the rights as we're as we're seeing now already as we're filming this and, and as I anticipate us continue seeing. But if I go into a gym and, you know, I have a, a fade and um, I go into a gym and it's my happy place and I don't really, I haven't really incurred a lot of bullshit in gyms like other people have. And um, my, the worst experience that I have in the gym is every single time I have to go into the ladies locker room because I'm anticipating someone going, sir, you can't go in there or what are you doing in here? Or, um, a couple years ago, just pre-COVID, in the gym in my town where I was exercising, which is a, a pretty um, high-end facility, major facility in the area, I had someone watch me undress. And it was a, a horrible, horrible experience that brought me to experiences of when I was young and um, when I would be shamed for, for who people perceived me to be specifically when I started to get good at sports and my friends started to get good at sports and we were playing on travel teams and doing different things, we would get heckled by groups of boys that would just call us lesbians and dykes. And that was the first time I ever heard those words. I didn't know what they meant. I had to like ask my mom what a lesbian was. And she was like, uh, you know, and then <laughs> we talked about it. Um, but I had to tell her why I had to be like, and I was 10 years old. So when people talk about like all this stuff going on with kids reading books or kids having exposure that is like swaying them in some way, my first exposure to queerness and gayness were boys trying to put me in my place by calling me something, a slur that they 
they obviously heard somewhere as something was derogatory to call a girl or a woman. Yeah. And I think this, this whole experience you've had is abominable, A, right, that we can treat any other human beings this way. But I think it's not unique in the sense that if you are part of any community, right, whether it's you're slightly overweight or you're very short or very tall or any physical difference that is visible to the rest of society, we've existed in a culture for a very long time that like makes it okay to call out and target those people as different. And I think we're seeing a really big shift. And this is part of the reason why I think it's such a great time to be talking about this. And the work that you're doing is so important, not just for your own specific group, but for the rest of us as well. Because, you know, as a young woman in the gym as well, (laughs) I had so many experiences where I was marginalized and I didn't have any of the extra bits of, you know, being in the LGBTQ plus community or any of that. And I still faced all sorts of misogynistic behavior. Being the only female in the college weight room was its own discomfort, right? Every single time I walked in, I was the only female in there. I was definitely the only female working on upper body because women just didn't do that, right? Like, why are you on the bench? And let me help you with that. And, oh, you're going to hurt yourself, little girl. And all of these things. And I think, you know, it it was the late 80s, early 90s, right? So it was a very different cultural landscape as we're seeing now. And, you know, every time I accidentally show my daughter a movie from the late 90s or early 90s, I start cringing about 10 minutes in. I'm like, oh, God, I never noticed any of that stuff. And so it says so much about how much has changed. But there is still so much road to travel and the fact that you're still facing these issues and these experiences when you go into a public space tells us that right and you know we could talk politics as well and and just even just what's happened in the past couple of days with the court documents that have been leaked about Roe versus Wade I think this is the most important topic there is right now right is like human rights not just women's rights not just you know LGBTQ plus rights, not black rights, white rights. It doesn't matter. Like we've got to get to a better place where we're treating each other well, always, right? Regardless of our differences. And I think this is why you're here, right? So one of the things we talked about when we spoke last before any of this um, egregious offense against human rights came out in the news was this idea of inclusion and, and what it takes to make somebody feel comfortable in an environment, right? Because, you know, fitness has its own issues, whether, you know, if once we even eliminate just the marginalized communities <clears throat> within fitness itself, there are actually plenty of cliques and groups and belief systems that tend to exclude rather than include people. And so, since you were a gym owner, I mean, you still are a coach and a gym person, right? But you don't own a physical facility at this point. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you made people feel more welcome. Like what were some of the things that you implemented to make people walk in the door, know it was a safe space and want to stay? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think that this is where, and what you were saying as well, of talking about like body autonomy and women's rights and what's happening in our country currently with, you know, Roe versus Wade. We have to realize that we are all interconnected with each other, that we are all human beings, that we all want the same things, that we all have really basic needs as far as, you know, when we talk about inclusion, when we talk about making people feel comfortable, all of those things, this is something that we all have to work on because we also all carry different levels of privilege considering our identities, right? Mm -hmm. So like going back to what you were saying, like I've definitely experienced a lot of bullshit around who I am, around the clothes that I wear, around my haircut within my family and then within the larger world and then within fitness, it's like a whole nother thing, right? I could talk about yeah. what has happened before at fitness conferences and stuff, but I, that's, it's nothing compared to the stories that I know of, of, you know, my trans friends who are women, who, you know, my, fr- my trans friends who are black women, who tell me the most horrific stories that I've heard in our community. Right. So it's like, and I identify as a non-binary person, but because I, I am white and because I also present as more masculine and because I know what I'm doing in the weight room, I actually have a certain amount of privilege that comes with me where, you know, like my guy friends or my fitness friends or people I've worked with, you know, in nutrition or whatever, like I'm a bro to them. 
you know, mm-hmm. like, like th- there's something to that. Like I definitely have white privilege. And then I also inadvertently, <laughs> because I present more masculine, I have, yeah, I have privilege. Male, yeah, I have broke privilege. <laughs> and so the other thing about it is when we talk about inclusion, it's like, who do we see in the gym and who do we not see? Chances are you've probably seen someone that looks like me in the gym. And you may have thought that they were just kind of like a butcher, a lesbian, or they were gender nonconforming, whatever, wherever your mind went. Right. And I'm not saying this in a derogatory way. I'm saying this in a way of like, that's really how people think. Right. Like that's, Mm -hmm. that's where things go. Right. Um, You know, sporty lesbian chick, like that's a, that's a cliche. It's a stereotype, Um, right? It's a stereotype. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so, but what you don't see is I don't see any effeminate men in the gym and I don't see people that are openly, if they are a feminine, feeling themselves to be that way and to feel safe in that place and to bring their whole selves to that place. I don't see that happening. Right. So like then that goes to this idea of privilege that when we're talking about gender and this this is this includes everyone. And I saw this play out in my studio where I had cisgender white corporate executive types in my space and cisgender just means that they were assigned male at birth and they identify as male that that's where their power is that's their confidence that's who they are right because gender is our felt sense of ourselves of who we are um who you know would come into our space and one of the things that my wife and I would do is talk about how unique everyone is as, as an individual that your needs are unique that that one of the practices we want to break is looking around the studio at what other people are doing, that we mm-hmm. don't challenge other people to lift weight that we're lifting, that so much of that has to do with your training age. It has to do with, you know, what's going on physically. Are you hydrated? What's your stress level? What's your, you know, how did you sleep? <laughs> yes, sleep, exactly. All of that yeah. kind of stuff. That it's literally everything. Right. Um, and it, it was a very non-competitive and very cooperative environment. And I think that that is something that is really important that gets missed because we tend to bring in the worst parts of sporting life into the gym and make mm-hmm. it a competition. And now we see that with, you know, all of these different parts of our industry being competitive. That's fine if you want to do that. But that is not that is not beneficial for most people. Like if you're, if you're specifically going on a sports team or specifically wanting to train in order to compete, fair enough. But when every studio is like that and when you're going into gyms and everyone's competing with each other, I had these guys where I was just talking about and I said to them, I said, why? I would just randomly ask people over and over again if they'd been with us for a couple of weeks, if they'd been with us for a month, um, you know, why do you come here? Like what, what is interesting to to you about our space? And usually they would just talk to us about it anyway, but these two guys I'm thinking about in particular were like, you know, I deal with so many competitive assholes at my job. Like everything is a competition and everything is a pissing contest. Their words. And I don't, I don't want, I just want to like have a good time and like lift weights and like get sweaty and just that's it. And like high fives you know, because we were big on high fives. Um, But their whole thing was that we were not a competitive environment. So they, Mm -hmm. as men, and as these alpha male people in the whole rest of their life, um, could actually come into our space and not be that and just chill the fuck out and like get the workout in and we would dance and we would high five and they'd be working out with women that were in their 50s that were outlifting them in some ways because they may have had injuries or they may just not have been lifting for very long. You know, that's the other thing we can do too. You have this really great analogy um, for this exact thing that you're describing and you've brought it up in multiple other other conversations we've had, but it's this flowers in the garden thing. So I would love for you to talk about that a little bit because I think it really sums up the, what we're trying to achieve and the also the reality of human existence, right? You you very, very rarely find a very homogenous group of individuals. We all have unique attributes, unique differences, unique things that make us who we are, right? And we don't have to make those things negative. So please talk about the flowers in the garden. 
Yeah. Well, I love flowers. I always grew up being outside and being in nature and my mom loves flowers. And I worked as a gardener for a while when I was like just out of college and I needed just a break from, you know, heady shit. Um, and I just became so intrigued with just the vastness of diversity in the natural world. And I'm a scuba diver as well. And so then you enter into this whole other world of vastness in the ocean. And it's just, it's, it's bizarre to me that we have, we appreciate and love all of this beauty in the natural world and in all of these different ways and animals and fish and plants and trees. And, um, and then when we come down to talking about human beings, we're like, oh, and you exist like this and like this. Mm-hmm. So there's two ways that we exist and, and that's quote unquote natural. And I, I hate when people talk about that word with mm-hmm. human beings because nothing about our society is natural for us, which is why mm-hmm. we're so diseased and sick. Yeah, <laughs> like, preach. I mean, don't get me started, right? Like, this is my favorite. <laughs> it's just nothing. So when I think about that and I think about, you know, how intersectional our identities are, which means that we come into society with all of these different ways of being and presenting and all of these, you know, we have so much within us that isn't recognized and isn't allowed in our society because of power structures, because of things that have been in place for hundreds of years. And so my thing is we're all flowers in the garden as like, let's actually take that lens of appreciating beauty and uniqueness and, and even even drama, like how, you know, amazing some things that we see in the natural world really are and awe-inspiring. Why, why can't we bring that frame to human beings? Mm -hmm. Like why do in the United States, you know, in Western cultures, like why is it normative for girls to have long hair and for Mm -hmm. boys to have short hair? And if you have a short hair as a girl, (gasps) what are you doing? Like, why, why do you look like that? Oh my God. Like, what the hell's the matter with you? Like, why do you want to look like that? You know, and it's mm-hmm. like, and it's, I've had people say to me, you'd be so pretty if you grew, grew out your hair. And I'm, and I want to be like, fuck you. Like you want to say that, but then, you know, you could be then, so nice if you didn't talk. If you didn't <laughs> talk. <laughs> right. But then, but, but like, because people think that they're actually trying to help you, Hey, Thank look, you, you could just fit in and not have to deal with all the shit you have to deal with. If you just look like everybody else. Mm, how yeah. fucking horrible you know yeah. and and that's the stuff when we talk about like what gets in like how we're all connected is that me being free means that you're free right that right so like when we talk about body autonomy in the trans community and trans health and you know you know i'm, I'm gonna get top surgery like those types of things I want to be able to do whatever I want with my body and not have the government tell me that I can't because I'm, I'm not fitting into a box that they're telling me is the only way to exist in my life. And that's the same thing that's happening with women. And when we make these connections on body autonomy and we realize that the only people that are not regulated are men. Right. And look, I love guys, but like guys have to be here with us. You know, cisgender men have to be here with us and be like, wait a minute, this is ridiculous because Mm -hmm. that's really what it comes down to. It comes down to freedom of expression, of bodily expression. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the reality is they are very often the perpetrators of their own like demise sort of in the sense that like they're the ones who've made the rules and they're trapped by them just as much as everyone else is. Right. To bring it back to the flowers in the garden thing, if you planted a garden full of all the same flowers, it would not only be boring, it would be unhealthy. Right. Because the diversity in nature is actually what makes it strong and what makes it function well. And when we see diversity declining in nature, we know there's a problem. So this idea that we're not supposed to have it as human beings or that it's definitely something we should try to eradicate and normalize or like, and I mean, normalize in the sense of homogenize, right? I don't mean in the sense of make it okay, but like when we're trying to homogenize something, it's literally bad. It's bad for the I thought we all got this from like, the, you know, in you know that was from PSA. Gully in the 90s, damn it. But where's that movie gone? I don't know. So, Fern movie? Fern Gully. Did you not watch Fern Oh Gully? my God. Oh, Fern I Gully. I love Fern Gully. Come oh, on. my God. It's like one of my favorite. Krista the Fairy. Love yeah. Her. Avatar. Yeah. 
Yeah, also yeah. Avatar is like the <laughs> modern 3D. That was the first movie I saw in 3D and it just like did not work in 3D. I, I, did, I got no 3D out of it. And I thought this was the longest three hours of wearing these useless glasses ever. Oh, no. But it was a great movie and it talks about that too, right? And I think this is this is the theme if you look at media and art and you know, anything in entertainment, the messaging there is usually pretty clear and consistent that like we need to be stewards of our environment and stewards of mm -hmm. diversity and, you know, we need to take care of this stuff. And yet we continue to act against it. Right. And, and I think this plays out, especially in the, the field of health and wellness, right? Because it's, it, again, personal soapbox moment, but it, it comes down to this idea that anytime you have human rights issues and you, you monetize them in any way, you're corrupting them, right? You have an ethically mm -hmm. corrupt issue, which is where we're at with healthcare, right? As soon as we yeah. privatized healthcare, we started having way more issues, right? It, you cannot take the interest of the self and put it into a public good situation, right? That's just a violation of human nature, right? We are a flexible collaborative species. It's a unique position we occupy in the world, right? Like even ants, they cooperate, but they don't have flexible cooperation. It is our biggest strength. And when we try to stamp it out with what we're doing now with like all of these, you know, conformity things, it actually really harms everyone. So... <laughs> I mean, that's like, that got kind of meta there for a second. Sorry. It <laughs> happens sometimes. But like, if we, if we bring it back into the world of health and fitness, you said something really interesting. And I, I think I want to bring it back to some of your personal experience, not just with your own studio, but working out in the gym as well, because there is this pass that some women get. And, and I think it's this, it's, um, what do we say? It was bro something. A bro, a bro privilege, bro privilege. That's it. I think that's the word of the day. But like, I, I can say personally as well, I've experienced bro privilege, but every single time I walk into a gym, I have to earn it again. Anytime I go to a new mm. gym, I have no street cred until I'm in there with those bros and they approve of me, right? Which is an insane place to be. So if you are not one of these stereotypical people that can get away with getting, gaining bro privilege, for example, if you're a feminine male, right? And I'm right. not sure if I'm using the right terms there. Like there's no way in. What are you, how are you supposed to exist in that world? And I think that's horrible. Right? Yeah. Like it's a terrible thing to do to somebody because it causes so much internal pain. And I think that's something else you've talked a little bit about already as well is this internalized trauma that people get from not being able to fit in, even though there's no viable reason that they can't, right? There's mm. really no, it's just a completely arbitrary set of rules that's keeping them from fitting in. And then we see things like depression and anxiety going through the roof and we wonder why, right? Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's a mystery personally. <laughs> right. But, well, I mean, but there's a question reflective. in there, but... <laughs> I mean, but I think you're a reflective person and you are looking at it in a, in a systems level. You know, not everybody is. I mean, I think the biggest thing about gender is that it's challenging to people because for people that have worked their whole life to maybe dampen down or quiet parts <laughs> of them that they needed to kind of leave on the side of the road in order for them to be accepted in society or you know, or people that just blindly accept it. And they're like, oh, okay, this is, this is what I learned. And this is how men are supposed to act. And this is how women are supposed to act. And there's only men and women. There's nothing outside of this binary, which is, I think, a good segue to start talking about, you know, the gender mm -hmm. binary is, you know, when we have those things and fitness is a hyper, hyper gendered space, like things happen in, in a fitness space that, you know, are, appalling, but they're also shocking sometimes. Like how often, for instance, women blatantly get hit on when they're working out in a gym. Like my wife was texting me a couple of weeks ago about dinner and she was at the gym and I was home cooking. And she's like, this guy keeps coming over and talking to me and like trying, you know, and I'm like, tell him to get the fuck away from you. Like you have to finish your work. Not only that, but like you have to finish your workout and get home. Like it's bothering you, <laughs> right? So like yeah. the fact that you know, the, the fact that as far as I know, and, and we, you know, I didn't have an orient, they didn't even give us an orientation at our gym when we went there. And my wife and I were like, this is interesting, but th there's no, there's no like line of communication 
there, there's no something that says, you know, explicitly, for instance, to women or explicitly to younger people, teenagers, because there are a lot of teenagers that worked out in my gym, too. And um, if something happens, if someone comes up to you, if someone asks you on a date, if someone starts asking you personal questions, if someone is staring at you, if someone will, if someone is following you around, you should go to this person right? You should come Mm -hmm. to the front desk. You should, we're going to talk about it. Nothing like that's posted. There's no code of conduct. And that's one of the things in my certification is that I have a policy expert talking about codes of conduct, talking about internal policy with staff, talking about external policy that is public facing that you have on social media, that you have on your website, that, you know, you have in your marketing, all of that kind of stuff. Like if, if someone explicitly said, come to our gym, you will not get hit on. And if someone (laughs) bothers you, we will bounce them the fuck out. Tell me you're not going to go to that gym. Right. Like that's, that's the stuff. we're That'd be great. Yeah. That like that, you know, and, and I hate to say it, but it's, it's usually men. The fact that men think that they can go up to someone with headphones on with that's, that's just doing their thing and working out and start chatting them up and talk to them and trying to ask them out and do these things. It's, or just stare, you know, I might have bro privilege, but there's definitely people in there that do not want me to have bro privilege. And that's a whole other thing. The, yeah. the only two times in my life when I've been physically threatened have been um, huge bodybuilder type mm-hmm. men who literally, and both times I was standing in line. Once I was at a keg party when I was like really young, like in my early twenties and, at a friend's party and it was all like artists and stuff like that. And um, a bunch of people found flyers and came in. And then all of a sudden there were all of these like super juiced up guys. um, And they started harassing people. And I was one of the people they harassed. Another time I was literally standing in line with my sister and all her friends and I had a shaved head and like sandals on and, you know, a t-shirt. And I was like just 21. And this guy in line was like, starting to harass me and his girlfriend got him out of line and literally pushed him to the other end of the parking lot. And I was trying to tell my sister and her friends what was going on. And my sister's like, Oh, you're just making that. That doesn't have anything to do. You're just making. So that's the other thing that needs to happen is that people need to understand safety that, Mm -hmm. that, you know, for queer people, we're hypervigilant because all of us have had instances of some degrees of um, having unsafe things happen, either very low level, like the stuff that I'm talking about, because I didn't get physically assaulted, to then the level of the fact that people in the trans community are four times as likely to be victim of violence crime. And that when we talk about trans people who are murdered in this country, it's overwhelmingly Black trans women. Yeah. And so we need to be talking about the fact that if you don't fit into these gender binaries and depending on other levels of your identity, of your level of safety, right, then that means that you are way more susceptible to people who want to put you in your place mm-hmm. and they want to make you feel uncomfortable or they want to physically say things to you to just to let you know that, that okay. you are not yeah. appropriate looking and that you are at the same bar as them or whatever else it is. And they take it upon themselves to police the people around them. And that's what we've seen in our country when we're talking about abortion laws in Texas and people Ugh. policing other people. And oh this is very disturbing, but it's been happening in the queer community for as long as it's been there because it's people policing you, telling you, you do not exist in a way that is valid. And we see that by lawmakers, right? Yeah, you absolutely. In a way that's valid and um, your aesthetic is not appropriate according to me. And I'm going to take it upon myself to let you know that if I wanted to, I could just totally fuck you up right now. Yeah, I mean, I have so many different things. I can't quite pick a direction, but there's a I lot. Think, there's a lot to it. But I think one of the things that it's occurred to me just now, and I might butcher it because it's a new thought. But when I think about human behavior as a series of patterns, and and you know, when we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs and and some other different frameworks for how humans make decisions and how emotions impact our decisions, when you said something around, there are a lot of people who have had to make meaningful effort to conform. 
And when they see somebody who isn't doing that, I think it hits a fairness button. It feels unfair to them that that person doesn't have to do the same things that they've been doing, that they don't, they don't suppress those things within themselves the way that they have. So it's like a, you're not sharing my suffering problem. And it's never really occurred to me like that. Cause I've often tried That's to really interesting. Out Mm-hmm. why somebody would feel so threatened by somebody else's choices, right? Because that's what yeah. it is. It, it feels like a threat to them. Like the fact that yeah. you can cut your hair short and, you know, change your pronouns, that's threatening to them for some reason. And I've, I've been grappling with this for a while because you're seeing more and more of this publicly, mm-hmm. right? And so it's just now occurring to me that they don't feel like maybe they're hiding their own true right. selves and that it's uncomfortable for them to see that somebody else has not chosen that. Right. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a known fact, you know, in the LGBTQ plus community that the most homophobic people that you're ever going to encounter are usually closeted. Closet, right. Gay it's people. Not really true. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's something where if, if you are, are so violently offended by just the fact that I'm gay, what is happening inside of you? Because that obviously has right. nothing to do with me. And it's the same thing with the gender thing, right? Like I'm just out here living my life, wanting to be who I want to be. And for other people, like you said, that feel like either they couldn't do that for some reason, or, you know, that it wasn't attainable to them, or they have certain beliefs that, that preclude them from actually being their true, honest, unique self. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of it is, you know, there's a lot to it. I mean, if we think about it, the, the, mm. it's it's multifaceted and everybody and and I don't I also don't dog anybody that is closeted or feel like they can't come out for reasons of their safety or anything else. And mm-hmm. I think that that's worth talking about, too, when we talk about trans visibility, as, you, as you've seen since like 2019, especially as trans and non-binary people have become more visible, have become more mainstream in things like Hollywood, have just gained this much wider audience of people that are, um, and statistically, there's a poll that came out in 2021 um, that 50% of Americans know someone who is trans. And for millennials and Gen Zs, that goes up to 63%. And so with this wider scope of just accessibility and visibility has actually come a massive backlash in so and that's something that happens on the individual level we'll see we're seeing it on like the wider country you know level but on an individual level as well you know sometimes people will not talk about who they are and that's why curious questions actually get a little bit scary for people for a number of reasons but some of it is that you don't know where someone's coming from so the same thing when people would ask me about my sexuality or would or first of all, would think that they could just approach me because they assume something about me and they met me at a party and they want to ask me a question about lesbians. And it's like, really? Um, I mean, I, I'm, you know, we, we wouldn't do that to someone else. Right. So then th- this is this is where this kind of like mindlessness comes in. And, mm. and also, I would say like second class citizen dehumanization comes in where people think that they can go up to you and ask you extremely personal questions about your sex life, about your body, about whether you've had any surgeries, about whether you're on any hormones, you know, all of these different things. And um, one of the things that I talk about in my certification is um, Laverne Cox, who is probably the most famous out trans person, she was on Katie Couric in, I think, I can't remember when it was, 2014 or something. That was when Orange was the New Black, got really big, the show she was on. Mm-hmm. And um, the first thing that Katie Couric did was ask Laverne Cox about her genitals. And she was on the Katie Couric show. I mean, that was like one of the <laughs> biggest news shows. And Laverne Cox had this amazing comeback, which was basically that, you know, when we talk about the trans community, when we talk about trans experience. And then she talked about violence. She talked about homelessness. She talked about job loss because when people transition or when people are trans or if, 
or if they don't look a particular way or people don't think, quote unquote, they're passing, um, looking the way that they should look. Um, there's, there's all of these statistics around this. And then also the rate of violence. And she said, you know, when we just focus on transition um, and this, in the case, medical transitioning, we don't get to talk about all these other things. But the thing about that is this person's on national TV. They've made it. They're on a talk show that is like one of the probably the top five most walk, watched talk shows at the time. Katie Couric was a big deal for a long time. Right. It's like going on Oprah. And can you imagine going on there and someone asking you about your genitals? as the first question that that's what I'm talking about. And yeah. I think things are very different now. Oprah did that to her too. And Oprah has since apologized. There's like footage of Oprah talking about it and talking about unlearning these things that we learn in our society, how to treat other people. And we learn, and Laverne Cox made an amazing um, documentary called Disclosure that's on Netflix. And if you haven't seen it, you should definitely watch it. I didn't and, know about that actually. That yeah. would be... Yeah. Really and it's all watch. about this. It's yeah. all about how we are taught to laugh at people that are gender nonconforming, that we're taught to dehumanize people that were, you know, that that people are thought to be um, abnormal or absurd. All of these things that, you know, we know now what happens when we other a group of people. It means that we're signaling to everyone else that it's totally OK to violate and attack and murder that group of people because <laughs> consider them as part of our humanity. I think that's a really important point that you're making because there is that element of othering people. That's like, I've never heard that as a verb before, but that is epic because that's, that is how we justify atrocities across the board, right? It doesn't matter what group we, we do it to overweight people. We do it to um, the less abled or people who have physical challenges or mental health challenges. We other people all the time and it allows us to behave differently. So I think maybe something useful to do would be to say like, how do we create a framework for curious questions that's supportive and not damaging, right? And and how do we stop making them other? Like, because for me, the first thing I want to say is like, don't ask a question to somebody that you would be uncomfortable asking your family members, right? Like, mm -hmm. I can't imagine going up to my mother and being like, hey, what do your boobs look like nowadays? Like, I would never do that, right? Because there's a barrier there. There's like a a social barrier, it's invisible, but everybody knows about it, right? So how do we start creating better social barriers, like useful ones? And how do we start creating frameworks for conversation that conversations that are respectful, but that also help people get their questions answered? Because I think that if if people are fearful of asking questions, we don't make progress either. Yeah. Right. And I know a lot of people that I've talked to, um, <clears throat> excuse me are really fearful of offending people nowadays. And this is another huge element of what's going on in our culture right now is this idea that the there you can get canceled, right? <laughs> and if you don't know exactly the right terminology, it's not safe to even learn about it. And that's taking us in the wrong direction. Yeah. So what, yeah. what, what should people do? <clears throat> um, well, there's a couple of things that people can do. And I think that this is a really important Thing that we need to talk about and something that I talk about in my certification as far as like how to do this in a health and coaching space in order to be inclusive, in order to be non-offensive and, and also to, to make sure that people are safe as well. So when we talk about this, you know, I talk about this as an educator, as someone that just kind of got fed up with everything I was experiencing in the fitness, mm -hmm. you know, community and fed up with what was happening in our country and said, you know what, I need to and I also came to this and had language for this, for my gender stuff, as far as being someone that's non-binary much later in life, because it, it didn't, when I was growing up, I had friends that were trans that were in, you know, the LGBTQ plus community, but I didn't feel myself to be trans. I didn't, I didn't feel like I was male. And so I was like, okay, but I didn't feel like I was female either. I didn't feel like I was a woman either. So I just was like, okay, I guess that's just me. Like, I guess that's just my thing. But for me specifically, when we talk about this, I'm putting myself out there as someone who's talking about this, who is an educator, who's continually educating myself, myself because language changes, you know, all the time too. I did just pluralize myself. I think that you were laughing about that, Liz. Um, but that's okay. I mean, that's kind of, you know, that's, that's how I feel myself to be. Um, but I think it's an important question because people are not there to educate you. 
So when people come up to me, when I'm in a social environment or when I'm doing whatever, or sometimes it would happen to me at the gym and it would be a very well-meaning person. And I'd have to have this conversation. It's emotional labor, labor for people to do this. Not only that, you don't know where someone's coming from. Right. You don't know the next thing that someone is going to say to you. You don't know whether it's going to be offensive. You don't know whether you've just confirmed something for them and now they are going to are going to be violent with you. That's what you have to understand. And I think that people outside who don't have this experience, that's something that's not necessarily understood that well. And so I would say to educate yourselves, there's there's a couple of really good books. Um, I actually took them out because I didn't want to forget to talk about them. One is called Life Isn't Binary. Where's the thing? There you go. So Life (laughs) Isn't Binary. And um, the authors are Meg John Barker and Alex Ayntafi, who are both um, academics. And and, uh, I want to say, not psychologists. I can't remember. What's the other one? Psychiatrist? Not psychiatrist. Hmm. Sociologists. (laughs) Sociologists. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> I'll figure it out. Um, anyway, they uh, are, they're therapists. We can mm-hmm. just call them that Counselors. Way. Is it a counselor? They're, they're, yeah. Okay. yeah they're, um, and then another one is Evolution's Rainbow, which is mm-hmm. really cool. Um, also written by someone in the trans community. And it's on diversity, gender, and sexuality in nature and in people. So, when people talk about this, the whole book basically is formulated on like, hey, wait a minute. If we actually looked at nature, nature's queer as fuck. Like yeah. nature is <laughs> all over the place, right? Yes. And yeah. and and so um, that's that's a really cool resource as well. And that's mm-hmm. that's more of a, you know, a scientific read, but really interesting. You can also find tons of educational resources online. So the ACLU, um, you know, the Trans Law Center. Um, different communities near you. So different LGBTQ plus community centers um, have websites. Um, The Human Rights Campaign has a website with a whole different glossary of terms as far as like how to educate yourself on that. There's also some people that have been very influential on me as well in talking about and understanding gender, including the history of erasure and gender and kind of where the gender binary comes from, where the race binary comes from. And that person is a look. So A-L-O-K. And their Instagram is amazing. They work on degendering fashion. And um, our non-binary person who's writing is really beautiful. They're a, a performer. They actually were just on um, talking about non-binary people. Jonathan Van Ness, who is on Queer Eye, um, mm. is non-binary. And um, <laughs> they just had an episode of their own show called Getting Curious. It's on Netflix as well on gender and where Alok is on there and then a few other people as well, including um, someone from the indigenous communities in Maine um, who is called Geo Neptune, who is very interesting because there is a really long history of gender diversity in indigenous communities that, that were erased and eradicated with colonialism, with Europeans, Mm -hmm. you know, coming to the Americas. Um, And so that's really important history to know as well, because we also have to know that this system, this framework of the binary is something that is, is very new. It's not something that's, that's ancient. Gender diversity is ancient. It only appears to be a fad because nobody learns about it. Including right. gender diverse mm-hmm. people, we have to find our own histories. So do you know queer people? We have to find our own histories because people have been closeted and murdered and all of these things for for so long. And it's just silencing. You know, I, I was thinking about it the other day because I was thinking about my flowers in the garden. And imagine if someone was just ranting and raving in the garden, in in like a huge community garden, and they were tearing things apart, and they were kicking things, and everything got extremely violent. And they were yelling, oh my god, how come all these flowers are different colors? How come they're not all red? And their hands are, and this went on and on and on and on. (laughs) It's like the Queen of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland. (laughs) (laughs) Would you think that person had issues? Absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely that's, right. <laughs> right. Like that's what 
that's what our society, that's what that type of framework is doing to our society. And Mm -hmm. all it's doing is ripping apart the fabric of human beings and Mm -hmm. creating, you know, situations where we're isolated and we can't trust each other and we don't know where each other's coming from. And we have to, you know, people are canceling each other, whatever that's about. I mean, some of that's about responsibility, Mm -hmm. but I think that there's also, I think that there's, there also needs to be a, a perspective all around. So I think some of that is warranted rage at like enough is enough. Mm-hmm. People are getting killed. You're okaying the fact that people are murdered in this country. You need to be responsible for it. And then there, but there also needs to be like you talked about. I, I really see things like learning language and learning about each other as a bridge to inclusion. And Mm -hmm. that's one of the major drivers of my certification is, okay, we know where we're at right now in fitness, which is that it's exclusionary for a lot of different people because no one appears in these gendered boxes without struggle. They're not real. And therefore people can't bring their whole selves to the work. And if people don't feel safe or if people are getting hit on in a gym or if people are getting stared at, or people just had a really bad experience in the locker room, they're not going to be able to focus on what you're telling them about their form. Mm -hmm. And you might go away from that experience of going, oh, that person is so unfocused, where really I was concentrating on the asshole who's been staring at me for the last 15 minutes because he doesn't like my haircut. And he's, he's looking at me like he's going to beat the shit out of me as soon as you walk away. So that needs to be understood better by people in the fitness profession, because it is a place where a lot of stupid shit happens and, and a lot of trainers and coaches are clueless about it and people leave and they don't come back and, or they're trying to ascribe to this thing. And someone that really would love to get more into weight training and lifting comes to see you and they're a woman and they show up. And the first thing you ask them is how much weight they want to lose, which Mm -hmm. has also happened to me frequently in my life. Mm -hmm. And really, I just want to get jacked. And that's not a part of the conversation. And it goes further and further and further. And then I look at all the people that are doing the programs that I want to do and they're all men and I'm out of there. It's interesting that you bring that up because this was a real battle I had with the gym that I was running because I didn't own it. So I didn't have a hundred percent control over what we were doing, but I spent almost two years overhauling the intake process away from weight loss questioning because yeah. one of the most pervasive sales models in fitness revolves around men want to gain muscle, women want to lose weight, and they will literally target people based off of that. And it's so problematic on like a thousand levels of, you know, the things we've talked about today, but also on the, the assumption that the only valuable goal is to be smaller yeah. <laughs> or for men to be bigger. Um, And, you know, I think you you listed out a lot of unpleasant things that happen in the gym, but I also want to call out in in favor of men. I know men deserve a lot of what's happening right now, but I also feel like they're victims of their own system. And, you know, I see so many men trying to pick up weight they shouldn't be anywhere near out of a sense of ego because they're a dude and they can't possibly pick up the 10 pound dumbbells. I literally had a client say to me Mm -hmm. the other day, he's been working on his upper body strength at home because he's embarrassed that he wants to use the 10 pound dumbbells. So, you know, this happens to literally everyone that goes into a gym because there are this, these very, very narrow slices of the population who, who fit the criteria of what fitness looks like. Right. And Mm -hmm. unfortunately, as it stands now in fitness, these are the people who are getting the spotlight the most. And and that's what we're working on changing, right? We're really, really trying to say, no, actually fitness is a place for everyone. And fitness should be something that you're safe and comfortable to show up and do in whatever form it works for you. You know, because I know a ton of guys who would have absolutely loved to have tried a Zumba class, but they wouldn't set foot in that room. You know, and I I think a lot of this stuff is just so damaging for people, right? And and we can't see their pain. So I think what you were saying Mm -hmm. about, you know, when I asked the question, how do we create these safe spaces? How do we have these conversations? I think it's just about regaining that mutual respect for each other and not making someone other, right? We are all the flowers in the garden. We are all the different flavors and colors and shapes and sizes and blooming seeds that exist in the garden. And we should be better at appreciating that. Yeah. You know, I, I think yeah. 
and I, and I know we talked about this off camera last time we, we spoke, but this idea that this is a new societal set of rules is something I want to come back to sort of to tie this all together because as a, you know, a cultural anthropologist and somebody who's studied lots of different cultures and lived in different countries and you brought up some really amazing points about how the non-binary person used to fit into society. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that um, because I learned all about this in college, you know, 20 years ago or so about, you know, even ancient civilizations had all sorts of different places and um, not jobs, but like, uh, Roles. Thank you. That's totally the word I was looking for. Roles for people who were non-binary. And this has been a thing throughout human history, right? And we have all of this evidence in nature that there is a spectrum, right? And yet for some reason in the current model, <laughs> we've decided no more, right? So I think it's America's hatred for history. Oh, <laughs> like that. As soon as I went to Europe for the first time ever, I was like, well they, lo- well, they like history here. Oh, like, especially living in LA where it's like, that is two years old and therefore up to me. <laughs> that's so funny. But it's actually, that's a really good point, Liz, because they don't shy away from their history right. in Europe the way we do. And, you know, it, it may be a maturity of society thing. It may be a, like, just inevitable, can't really back away from that World War II thing. But even the British, you know, if you, my husband's actually... English and with, if you talk to him about colonization all of that he's definitely like embarrassed for his culture he's like oh he cringes a bit and there's a ton of you know dark humor and in, in British humor around what horrible things they did and you know it it's like they're willing to process their behaviors as a society and I feel like this is something Americans aren't we're not at a place we're still you know finger in the ear going no 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 everything is super awesome and let's make America great again I mean I hate to Right. But that's, right. that's what that conjures up for me when they say that. It's like, let's ignore the past and the things we haven't done perfectly. In fact, the things we've egregiously done wrong. Let's just not, that's just not a thing. Mm. Let's just move forward. Yeah. And I, th- I want to go back just for a second to what you were saying about guys, because I, listen, I have a brother. I love guys. Pretty much all my really good friends are guys. So I, I definitely see, and they talk to me about ways in which they struggle with this, when they, mm. how they struggle with their masculinity, how they struggle with body image stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and that's also a huge part of what I hear as well from the guys that I know in the queer community too. So it's not, it's not like it's without anyone. It's, you know, um, gay men have some of the highest rates of eating disorder, um, in our country. So it's, it's not just like it's, um, it's, it's not just us, it's everyone. But I think the stuff that I was trying to point out is that there are major safety issues for women and for gender diverse people that happen in gyms that go unlooked Mm -hmm. because it's outside of the experience of cisgender heterosexual men. For the most part, they might have safety issues among themselves, but there's not that same level or experience of that happening literally in a public space oh, yeah. repeat, repeatedly with different people. So I think that that, you know, I think, I think uh, Jen Sinclair, I saw some of her writing around that once and it was about, and she does unapologetically strong and, and she mm-hmm. wrote about all of that stuff that doesn't times when she sent things up the chain with like pretty high level people in the fitness industry about that very thing and nothing happened. Yeah. And so I, I think moving from there, this this type of framework of the binary framework, it's 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 a lot of things that coaches actually find super harmful in their clients, which is stuff like all or nothing thinking. Yeah, it's stuff like what do men do? What do women do? How am I supposed to show up at the gym? Right. Just what you were talking about with as far as guys not wanting to use lighter weights. It's all, all of that kind of stuff. Right. And I would always teach that with tempo. So I had this one guy that just did this all the time. And I would be like, hey, you got to hold that. I remember we were doing bent over flies. And yeah. I said, hey, you got to hold that weight up there for a second, you know, and then come down. We're not just trying to wing it out and flip it up there because he had ridiculous weight and he couldn't do it. And he put it down. And he goes, oh, I can't do it. And I said, well, what does that mean? Because this is also part of this education, right? Yeah. He goes, it means it's too heavy. I said, OK. And he ended up going down to like sevens. He had like 25s to start. And he, and he was like, holy shit, that was really hard. And I said, when you're able to actually get into 
that the form that we want with the tempo we want, it's going to be hard. You don't need to think that, you know, that the struggle is always going to be with this external weight. Right. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, that brings me to, we need to educate ourselves on other people. Right. So I try to educate myself on experiences outside of my experience. And that means reading books by by black authors. That means understanding what's happening in indigenous communities with land rights. That means understanding things that I don't understand, that I don't experience on a day-to-day basis that significantly affect other people. And if I'm someone that works with other people, I need to have a broader awareness of people's experiences so that I can actually be a coach for them, so that I can actually help them. And if I don't know about these experiences, then am I going to be doing a good job of making someone feel safe or that they belong or that I understand or at least have some basic knowledge about? And that's what we can talk about when we talk about privilege. Privilege is that you can choose whether or not to learn about gender diverse people. You can choose whether or not to learn about statistics in the LGBTQ plus community. All of us on here can learn there's something that, because I used to be a history teacher, and one of the most poignant things that I ever saw on social media was someone in a professional development who was a Black history teacher had a slide, and it, it went viral when it came out, which was probably 10 years ago now, a long time ago. But it was um, privilege. Privilege, it means that um, my history is an elective. He said, hmm. white privilege means that my history is an elective. And it is. We don't mm-hmm. learn explicitly about Black history or any people of color's history besides subjugation yep. of people all the way up until you get to college. So if you don't go to college and you elect not to take those classes, you never learn about it. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about these things and we talk about these things in the health and fitness space, learning about what binary conditioning does to us of like, what types of expectations do we have for people just upon meeting them? And none of us can actually back out of that influence. That's our cultural influence. It just is absorbed into us media. Like I just said, school, right? And I was a school teacher, right? Um, Everything, our family, the different regions that we grow up in. I grew up in Connecticut. I am going to have a very different experience of history than someone that grew up in Louisiana, the, the history books are different by state, people. <laughs> like you get to tell the story in the way you want to tell it. And so I think that just understanding and broadening that scope. And I think once people start to do that, and especially in fitness, once we start to broaden and go, wait a minute, there are no people with bigger bodies in the gym here. What am I doing? Right. What am I not doing? What? Could, how am I speaking to the community around me? Um mm-hmm building bridges and, and, and making connections. Um, those types of things are going to benefit everyone. And coming to it from a place, like when we talked about curious questions, right? Going to people who are, who are doing that work as part of their profession. I'm doing this as part of my profession to answer questions about why I use they, them pronouns. If someone were to do that to me, it, at a, a party, and I just did a two-hour training for a group of coaches about that, I might just say, you know what, there's some cool people I want you to check out on social media. Because frankly, I'm trying to chill out. All (laughs) coaches know this, right? (laughs) Someone finds out you're a nutrition coach, then your night is shot. Your night's done. They're going to ask you every question they ever had about low carbs. They're not going to even know what carbohydrates are. And they're going to ask you all sorts of crazy ass questions that you're going to be like, oh my God. So coming from my perspective, when someone does that to me about my own personal identity, it's annoying. And sometimes I'm like, okay, you know, whatever. But we have to understand that people don't owe you anything. So just like when we're coaches and we're nutrition coaches, I don't owe you free nutrition coaching just because you found out I'm a nutrition coach. I don't owe you any understanding about who non-binary people are just because you found out I'm non-binary. So the best curious questions to ask are, where can I get some good resources rather than putting it on the person individually? It sounds like what you're Mm -hmm. saying. Yes. Yes. I love that. Are there any, are there any good books that you would suggest that I read about? Because I really don't know anything about the trans community Mm -hmm. or about trans experience. 
And I think starting also from a place of, of showing somebody that you care, right? It's an old Berard yeah. quote. Like it's, it's people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? And mm-hmm. so I think this is another tool to give people is to start from a place of care and say, hey, I don't understand this. Admit that you don't understand it or that you don't know enough about it or that things have changed since you learned things previously and you'd like to know more, right? Like if you come at it from that place of caring and curiosity and openness, people are going to be a lot more receptive to potentially giving you some resources. And they also may feel less threatened than if you just come at them with a direct question of like, hey, tell me about your personal journey through this (laughs) this arena, right? And I, I think that is sort of, if I'm to sum up what it is you've been saying the whole time, is like, it is not the queer person's responsibility or the black person's responsibility or the marginalized community of any kind's responsibility to help you understand it. You can ask for guidance, but not very specifically from that one person, right? Because it is, you know, and anyone who is a participant in one of these groups, whether you're a female or you're really, really tall, Liz, I'm looking at you, right? Or any of I'm not people. even six feet. That's what, okay. Real oh, fast you're not? Fast. If I were a guy, yes. I'm 5'11". If I were a guy, they'd just be like, oh, yeah, that's fine. You're not, you know, but as a woman, it's like, oh my God, you're over 5'7". That's insane. That's like insane. all the time. You know, I'm and just I, like, I, I just, I just, see, Nicole think, Kidman gets away with it in society because she's like, super super skinny so if you're super super skinny and she's 5'11 she's like me that's fine that's fine you don't take up too much space right horizontally mm-hmm. just vertically yeah and I, and I think I brought Liz into it specifically because I think everyone has something about themselves that they may feel self-conscious about or that is different like there's no one perfect person out there that has literally nothing there uh, slightly sensitive about or self-conscious mm-hmm. about and so like if you just approach this in that way, I think it creates an environment of safety for people, right? Rather than just, it's like, I didn't, when I first met Liz, I didn't just walk up to her and be like, you're really tall, right? right. Like, right. Probably do you play volleyball? Do you play totally. basketball? Right? Like, I, I, and I you think- You want me to bounce you off the wall? I play, no. As much as people come at this from a place of, of wanting to be curious, I think they need tools. They need better tools to understand what that looks like without actually treading on somebody else's personal space and you know experiences so yeah yeah, yeah. Or, or their humanity I mean yeah. I think that that's you know what it comes to and and I agree that everyone has things listen life you know the whole thing life nobody gets out alive like you know that's definitely we all have difficult things to go through and it's definitely not I I don't I think I heard Brene Brown talk about this once like comparative suffering like who's suffering Mm -hmm. more you know I think about it like the compare like the suffering Olympics like that's not (laughs) that's not what this is about for me it's about understanding that if I don't know you and you just come up to me and you say can I ask you a personal question no (laughs) right no, I don't, I don't know you. And then also for people in different communities, if I'm trying to be open to that, say I was open to that, I might give you a response and then you might, like I said before, attack me. You might physically attack me. And I mm-hmm. think that that's what people have to understand when we're talking about gender stuff, when we're talking mm-hmm. about people's racialized experiences in this country who are not white um, who are people of color, it's it's really important to realize that people do have these experiences all of the time. And it might be so far away from what you are thinking, right? Mm-hmm. It might someone might say to me, I've had people do this and I and I kind of don't say anything and they they go, Where do you get your haircut? Right? So like the most benign shit, like, I love your hair, where do you get your haircut? Right? I I had a hard time just even responding to someone one day when they asked me, can I, can I ask you a question? And I didn't know them. And I'm a very open person. You know, I'm there, I'm doing all this kind of stuff, but I also carry a knife in my pocket. Mm -hmm. So that's something to, to be aware of. And when all this stuff was going on and all these laws, all these things started to come up, my wife and I were on a walk and she goes, "Do do you have your knife in your pocket? And I said, no, I don't have my knife in my pocket. And she was like, I think we should start bringing it on walks. And I live in Southern Connecticut. I live in an extremely affluent area. 
And it's and it's something where we just have to realize that other people what's happening right now is people's identities are being weaponized Mm -hmm. against them and people are getting the green light to be homophobic and transphobic and to be violent against different communities in the same ways that has happened in different racial communities continually in our country where we see those disparities. So I hear you. And I definitely, and this doesn't have to do with health and fitness, just this has to do with life. But just be aware that when we're talking to other people, we don't know who you are or why you're talking to us about this. So mm-hmm. you're, you're trying to be a better ally, and I absolutely love that. But go to the internet first and look at a glossary of terms and look at different people who maybe don't look anything like anyone that you've ever met before in your life. Start looking and realizing the diversity that exists among human beings and then you you will be a better ally, and then we'll be able to have a better conversation when we meet. That's great. I, I think it really comes home to this idea of like, for people to understand this, they have to figure out what that thing is about themselves is that they're uncomfortable about, uncomfortable about. And imagine if somebody came at them poking at that every second, and that they didn't feel safe because of whatever that was. And, and if I think you can understand that feeling in yourself, might help give them an idea of what people are experiencing and the fear that people are carrying around for their personal safety. Because mm-hmm. I don't think that's something that if you haven't really experienced it, that you really understand how it, it colors all of your experiences and all of your interactions with other people, right? I mean, how horrible to have to walk around in fear of interacting with those around you because they might be violent against you. And, and I mean, women can definitely relate to this across the board. So 50% Mm -hmm. of us (laughs) have an idea already. We have an experience that we can take and and hold up and say, ah, this is how this feels for other people, right? Finding that ability to empathize in a way that is relatable to you, I think is one of the most important tools you can bring to the table when talking to somebody who is different than you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You You know, I mean, I think there's, I feel like, unfortunately, the situation is becoming more binary and rather rather than less right now. But, you know, I just I feel like those of us who are out here doing this work and having these conversations and putting ourselves out there and, you know, really having the hard conversations like we're going to make it right. It's going to be OK because <laughs> yeah. there's so many more of us. There's so many more of us, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and if we just recognize that and if we keep meeting each other and finding each other and building bigger and better communities of this, then we can't not win, right? But it does feel like a pretty upsetting dark day (laughs) today. It's just that the negative, I just, I feel like the negative voices are just louder right now. And Mm -hmm. it's, it is, it is, if we're even just talking about like, like the laws that are getting passed throughout this country that are anti-trans laws. It's the same law. They're, they're copycat laws that are just getting pushed through in yeah. the same exact way, which is why it seems like it's like a domino effect of that happening because a very small group of people are very organized around doing this. And unfortunately they have people in positions of power politically. And so when we're talking about this and when we're talking about understanding each other and educating ourselves about each other, then we also have to have those considerations when we're doing things like voting in local elections. Then we also have to ask politicians if we're at a fundraising dinner or if we're somewhere else, ask about how people are being treated outside of your community. If you're somewhere and someone's talking, ask a question. How, like, like, what are you going to do to protect the rights of the LGBTQ plus community considering what's happening in this country? Because overwhelmingly, the people that contact me and the people that talk to about me, or talk to me, sorry, reach out, like post different trainings that I do, are parents of queer youth, or they're parents of trans youth, and they say, thank you so much for bringing this into fitness. I'm a fitness professional, I'm a coach, I'm a nutrition coach, and I have a trans kid. And thank you so much, because I had to learn all this stuff myself, and it's something where I worry about my kid's safety all the time. Mm-hmm. And that's something that's very important to know is that this is a part of everyone's community right. because another mantra I have for my work is that we're humans coaching humans, that we're all messy, we're all complex, we all bring to the table all this different variety of things with us, 
But at the same time, if we just show up for each other and we're willing to talk to each other and learn and build bridges and also willing to look inside of ourselves, if we have a response or a reaction to someone we see that maybe is an affront to something about us. And I'll talk about my mom in a minute, but that, that was a weird way to bring that up. But um, I was thinking about my mom. <laughs> yeah, because, because my haircut, when I was 17, essentially, and I shaved my head, um, my haircut was a major affront to my mom, who grew up in the 1950s, who is very status quo, who always wears earrings, who, you know, is a lovely, lovely person and is beautiful. And she thinks I'm a lovely person and she thinks I'm beautiful. And she just wants me to be beautiful in the way that she was raised that girls are supposed to be beautiful. Right. Yeah. So that, that was very, I understand that now at the time it was very difficult for me to deal with the disconnect between my mom and myself, as far as like why that was such a big deal for her. Um, I always wear gender non-conforming clothes, but when I cut off all my hair, she was pretty horrified. Um, and it came to the point of being in my late thirties where I had to sit down with her one day and I said, mom, I'm going to, I, I'm not going to talk about your haircut. She was like, what? I said, I'm not going to talk about your haircut. I really would appreciate it if you didn't talk about my haircut anymore. And it was just the final thing. It was little things here and there, her not saying things. And she finally got it. I said, it's just, I said, it's just a waste of time. And all it does is make me feel bad. And she was like, Oh, okay. Right. And then, and then she could just see me now. Now she can just see me and she can just see, Oh, okay. You know? So I, I think it's that type of stuff we have to look at and examine ourselves and say, what type of response am I having? And one, maybe where did I learn to have that response? Um, two, is, is there something that I need to learn? Do I need to seek out some information about this? Do I need to identify maybe where the source of this is for me in my life? Why do I have such a problem with the way someone else looks? Hmm. Yeah. I think it would be really, really great for us to make sure that we include in the um, the post about this some of the resources that Megan mentioned, just yeah. because I feel like the conversation that we're having is is fantastic, right? But I think the important thing is that people feel competent to take some kind of action after this, because talking about it is great. Yeah. We need to keep talking about it and we need to keep having conversations in safe places and even sometimes in not as safe places because we've got to get this moving forward again, right? But action is the secret. So mm -hmm. if anything you've heard today makes you think, hmm, I've recognized something in myself that makes me uncomfortable or I hadn't really seen that that way before or, hmm, I didn't realize that was somebody else's experience. I really want to make sure that at the end of this, you can go to the link in the, um, whether it's in <clears throat> the Spotify playlist or wherever, and you can find some resources so that you don't feel at the end of this conversation, like, okay, now I just don't know where to go next. Right. right. So please make sure, I mean, you can do it as an audio book. You can listen five minutes a day. You don't have to sit down and spend hours upon hours at a time listening to anything, right? This goes for anything you want to learn. But if you can find five minutes a day to just learn one new term or one concept or one thing from today's discussion, I think everyone will have a much easier time discussing this in the future and will feel more safe in the environments that they're in. So I don't know, what, do you have any last words of wisdom to kind of tie up everything that, because we've talked about so many different aspects of this today. It's been really, really awesome. Um, it definitely lived up to my expectations for how this conversation was going to be. Um, but if there was like one thing, one takeaway from this around fitness, let's try to make it about, you know, safe spaces and fitness. What would it be? What would you want people to know? Um, safe spaces and fitness. I, I think that coaches are, I know a lot of coaches are going to be listening to this and obviously we're all coaches here. I, I think that coaches are amazing people because we're dedicating our lives to helping other people actualize what they want for themselves and transform themselves. And so I think coaches hold this really special place in society. And I think that we are going to be part of the healing process. 
we're part of the healing process for our clients. I know that the work of coaching has been very healing for me in myself. And I, the way that I think about it in fitness, in coaching, but also in life too, is I think that we're all here for each other. When people say, what is life about? What is this about? The, the most blissful experiences I have are helping other people and allowing myself to be helped by other people and finding that community. And so I think if we just keep in mind, knowing that we know no idea why we're on this planet or what the hell's <laughs> going on and, you know, all this stuff, if we really start to zoom out, um, that I think that we're all actually here for each other. And I think if we start mm -hmm. there, that's, that's a pretty amazing place to start. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Liz, you haven't had a lot today, but anything that you took away from this conversation? Um, it's just, you know, when you're hearing about someone else's experience, even if it's, um, something that doesn't directly pertain to you, it, you, you know, I just found a lot of what you were saying, Megan, I'm like, oh yeah, I really can, um, can empathize with that, you know, from, from my various worldly perspectives and, um, it's just. It's all very connected. Yep. And that's really humans helping humans and it's humans, humans yep. recognizing humans. Coaching humans. Yeah. Humans coaching. <laughs> all right. I think that's it really. It's about that, right? Whatever role you're in, you have an opportunity to help somebody else. That's what you should probably be doing. Right. And just, just, just to make it totally awkward. That's what Jesus would do. So if you're particularly <laughs> religious and you, <laughs> and you're listening Sorry, that's something I never thought it would come out of your mouth. Right? That's like a, that's a pretty left turn for me, but uh, it did. It, it has been a lot in the, you the know, news lately. Some of this. Sometimes you so. even see animals helping out other animals, even animals Absolutely. that you think that would be their prey, and you're just like, oh, yeah, yeah. cats like keeping birds and cleaning that. It's like you know, it doesn't have to be competition. It doesn't have to be against each mm -hmm. other. There's plenty on this planet for all of us, and if we could just get past some of the, you know, greedy <laughs> tendencies our species has, I think we'd be doing a whole hell of a lot better. So uh, I just want to say, thing? Yeah, yeah. Hmm? oh, the thing, scarcity mentality, the thing yeah, I'm always scarcity. talking about, I have like the scarcity mentality that, yeah. I just want to say thank you so much to Megan for coming on yeah, and you. I want to make sure Liz, you have her Instagram handle or Megan, do you want to yep. say it again so that people oh, can yeah, find you? It. Yeah. Um, have it queer. It's at Habit Queer, right? On at Habit Queer, Instagram. yeah. Instagram. Are you on any other social media platforms that people can find you on? Um, I'm on Facebook, and um, but but mostly I've been doing stuff on. I'm kind of a dinosaur on Instagram because I'm in my 40s. But now that I'm going to be better at it, now that uh, now that the certification is kind of you know in the can, um, that's been a year's worth of work with collaborating with some amazing people, um, and so. Now that that's happening, I'm going to be more present on uh, on Habit Queer. So awesome! And yeah. if you're interested in coaching with Megan as well, I'm sure you can reach her through uh, Habit Queer as well. And yeah, this was amazing. This is a uh, this is a hell of a comeback. Thanks so much for joining us, and uh, hope we'll chat again soon. You got it. Thank you.